It's really a wonderful pleasure to be able to introduce Ian Bishop, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of Rhode Island School of Oceanography. Ian works on algal ecology and population genomics, specifically on diatoms in the Southern Ocean. He has done all sorts of things in his doctoral career of participating in ocean cruising, cruises, including the LTER program. He's operated a flow cam on a ship. I saw it tied down with straps. <laughs> um, he's researched uh, diatom evolutionary change over short time frames and uses um, diatoms and cultures and genomics to do his work. Um, Ian plans to defend his dissertation in spring of 2023. And today he will be talking to us about genetic diversity and population structure of polar diatoms. So thank you, Ian. Great. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, it's a real treat to give this talk a um, talk about a little bit of what I've been up to for the last couple of years uh, with uh, regard to genetic diversity and population structure of polar diatoms. So switch, David. Uh, so um, for those of you that don't know, Southern Ocean diatoms are important blooming communities uh, with a really large global biogeochemical impact. They form the base of productive and efficient marine polar food webs, and they also contribute disproportionately to uh, global carbon export to the deep sea. Just for a little context, uh, on the right, I have two uh, modeled uh, distributions uh, showing kind of the scale of what we're working with here. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a uh, total chlorophyll map um, for the Southern Ocean Austral Summer kind of give you a sense of what that bloom looks like. It's uh, pretty large, it's circumpolar, and it's uh, increasingly strong toward the coastal continental areas um, of the Southern Ocean. And then on the right-hand side, you have another globe, uh, a paired globe, showing what that signal represents, that chlorophyllized signal represents. And really, what it represents in December and January is an intense diatom bloom, specifically diatoms. There's a lot of phaocystis in there. There's a lot of coccolithophore in there, but that red you see is uh, suggests that each each of those red pixels is a, a pixel dominated by diatoms. So next slide, David. Um, so it's important that we, um, given their their prominent role, it's important that we understand uh, the ways in which they can be resilient to or adapt to ongoing and predicted climate change in the region. Um, one of the, and a particularly important uh, component of this resilience is genetic diversity. And so standing genetic diversity or the, just the overall genetic variation in a species uh, between individuals represents a key component of any species ability to adapt or withstand to rapid environmental change. In other words, it's, a, it's an important part of its adaptive potential. The more standing genetic diversity there is in general, the more trait variability, physiological, behavioral variability there is that can be expressed by a population or a species. And that generally uh, can help with successful adaptation to novel uh, environmental conditions. So uh, what, what do we know about what regulates genetic diversity? This is not a, a, talk of, uh, a big talk about the uh, evolutionary biology, but I, will, I would like to point out that there are a couple of very important factors and forces that shape the abundance and structure of standing genetic variation. A couple important ones, I'm sure you've heard of some or if not all of these, but uh, natural selection and genetic drift, each in their own way, uh, tend to remove genetic diversity from a system, either by retaining the most fit individuals or randomly um, uh, absolving uh, genetic diversity through uh, random fixation. Uh, that removes population uh, genetic diversity. Mutation and gene flow, on the other hand, tend to add or augment a population's genetic diversity. Um, next, David. Um, so the, the patterns that we measure in terms of when we look at genetic diversity tend to be the outcome of specific combinations of these forces. 
that play out at varying degrees or intensities. So what does that often look like? There, I'm gonna show you three specific patterns that are commonly seen in uh, the ocean and, and in terrestrial environments as well. Um, the first is the simplest. Uh, panmixia is uh, essentially is a pattern that we see when there's no real geographic structure um, in, in a population. So in this PCA plot here from Deagle et al, this is a plot can you see my mouse when it moves by chance? Maybe not. Um, no, it looks like no. So this is a PCA plot showing a bunch of individual Antarctic krill. Uh, and the closer the dots are, the, the more genetically similar those two individuals are. And what you can immediately see is that there's no separation or segregation of these individuals based on the color coding, which represents where they came from in the Southern Ocean. So these samples were, were collected from very far apart and their genetics look relatively similar. Um, if you uh, go forward one, David, so that suggests high gene flow, a lot of connectivity. An alternative model is isolation by distance. And what this is essentially getting at is um, as the uh, in geographic distance increases between two individuals or two populations, you tend to see an, uh, a change in genetic similarity. So the farther apart these individuals are, the less genetically similar they look. This is a plot from Castellan et al. in 2010, looking at Pseudonitia pungens populations, a, a cosmopolitan marine diatom. And they found a really strong signal of an isolation by distance, um, whereby uh, individuals from really distant localities from uh, completely separate ocean basins started to look very different genetically. And that suggests that uh, this type of pattern usually suggests a very strong role for dispersal limitation. Um, that distance really gets in the way of connecting populations. Uh, if we go one more, there's, a, there's another model that uh, we can see um, and have seen in diatoms uh, in particular is uh, isolation by environment. This is very similar to isolation by distance, except instead of looking at geographic distance, as a structuring mechanism, uh, structuring force for genetic relatedness, we start to see um, environment itself, environmental variables, abiotic variables, and, and, and antibiotic variables shaping how related individuals are. So the pattern here is as you increase environmental distance between two individuals or populations, you start to see a genetic divergence as well. So in this study by Whitaker, uh, sorry, Whitaker and Reinierson in 2017, uh, Thalassius ira rochula, um, as the temperature and chlorophyll A concentrations uh, began to diverge, so too did population genetic difference. And this is essentially suggesting a, a prominent role for local adaptation instead of dispersal limitation. So those are two some of the better known studies looking at these types of patterns in marine diatoms, but both of those are temperate Global, uh, globally distributed diatoms. Um, so what might this population structure look like in the Southern Ocean? Well, the Southern Ocean has a couple of really um, unique uh, system characteristics. Uh, most uh, prominently, it is home to the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is the largest current structure in the world. It is circumpolar. It moves a tremendous amount of water um, in a relatively quick fashion around, around the globe and it has a tremendous potential to isolate and diverge genetic um, communities on either side of the frontal boundaries, so in a latitudinal sense, and that has been shown in a bunch of studies of, at various tropic levels. Um, it also has the uh, potential to improve uh, and greatly accelerate uh, genetic connectivity and gene flow within that system. So just like that krill example I showed you a moment ago, um, the Southern Ocean, next David, uh, the Southern Ocean is also home to a lot of uh, divergent um, and ecologically distinct, environmentally distinct ecoregions. Uh, you can look to Constable et al. Uh, for a wide assortment uh, to, to specifically look at where those are, but uh, needless to say, there's a lot of environmental heterogeneity within that system. Um, and so David, next. Um, 
so how do these characteristics shape diversity within the high uh, latitude, isolated cold waters of the Southern Ocean? Is it the case that the Southern, that the ACC is promoting really high gene flow and panmixia where populations look relatively the same regardless of where they're found in the Southern Ocean? Or is it weak enough that we start to see these patterns of isolation by distance, for example? Uh, that's unclear because no one's taken a look yet. Um, so for this talk, I will be addressing specifically two major research objectives uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, the first is to characterize the basic genomic structure and genetic diversity of Actinocyclus actinochilus, which is a representative Southern Ocean diatom. And the second is to, uh, I'd like to explore the basic structure, uh, spatial and environmental structure of that genetic diversity. So in order to address these objectives, my diatom of interest uh, is Actinocyclus actinochilus. This is a, a beautiful, uh, large uh, cosinodiscus-like diatom. It is, um, its type locality is uh, from the very high latitudes in the Ross Sea, closer to the continent where it was originally uh, described from pancake ice. Um, it can be quite large, up to 75 microns in diameter. And it's most often associated or found in the marginal sea ice zone. So that area um, right next to the sea ice as it's retreating in the austral summer, uh, really productive communities develop there. And that's where it's, it's often found, in, not in overwhelming numbers, but definitely regularly encountered. So uh, for this study, we have 30 individual diatom isolates that were collected in the winter of 2016, 2017 in the Austral summer. These, uh, they were on, uh, we were, my lab was on the uh, Nathaniel B. Palmer for a transect spanning uh, several thousand kilometers from the West Antarctic Peninsula and, um, at the top of this map down into the Ross Sea through the Amundsen and Bellinghausen Seas. And these 30 individuals were single cell isolated from waters at collected, surface waters collected at 11 different stations. And so, and then, and you can see from this map that there's a lot of spatial uh, variation uh, there's a lot of difference, uh, variation in the spatial extent um, between these uh, pairs of stations. If you go forward ahead, David, these stations are not only geographically distant or similar, there's not only variants there, there's also a lot of environmental her heterogeneity as well. You, uh, this is a PCA plot showing the average seasonal environmental differences and the variance uh, among in, of environmental variables among these 11 stations. And you can see pretty immediately that some of important abiotic factors like temperature, salinity, and nitrogen availability uh, are all um, nicely structured these three communities into what I'm using as a priori ecoregions. Um, the uh, West Antarctic Peninsula, I'll call the LTR because it's essentially in the Palmer LTR transect, uh, the Amundsen Sea and the Ross Sea. So these are our three ecoregions and 11 stations where we sampled 30 individuals. In terms of genomic methods, uh, I'll try to be brief here. We are, I'm happy to talk more about anything you're interested after uh, during questions, but the gist of it is we chose one of these individuals to develop a reference genome assembly. We made that individual culture from a single cell and uh, removed all the bacteria, made it azenic, and then we sequenced it using PacBio long read technology as well as short read Illumina um, sequencing. Uh, we, we did a hybrid de novo assembly. And then with that assembly, we went in and, and tried to identify where all the protein coding sequence and repeat region um, sequence was uh, in that assembly. And that left us with essentially a draft annotated genome. With that genome, we then did uh, Illumina short read sequencing, low coverage short read sequencing for our 30 genotypes. Um, we use that reference genome to uh, align all of those genotypes. And then from that alignment, we could get at some of these genome wide diversity estimates. And then importantly, we can also identify the specific base pair loci, uh, individual base pair sites where, uh, where there, this diploid organism varies 
And so these are our, our single pol uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, our SNPs. And from these SNPs, we can calculate genetic uh, relatedness or, or distance between individuals. So on to uh, our results. So first off, what does this uh, basic genomic structure of actinocyclus actinoculus look like? Uh, this is a snail plot. Um, if you're familiar with looking at some of the genome assemblies that seem to be coming out hourly at the moment, um, this is essentially a summary of all the major features of, uh, of a draft assembly. So our actinocyclus uh, genome uh, clocked in at about 1.4 gigabase, it's very large, uh, representing some 24,000 um, scaffolds. So somewhat, but not, uh, not at all perfectly uh, contiguous. Um, our median contig length or scaffold length here is 110 kilobase. Um, GC content is relatively low compared to um, other common other uh, model organisms and other diatoms that have previously been sequenced, uh, closer to 28% compared to high 30s, 40s, 50%. Um, and this is mostly due to a very high repeat content in this genome. So this genome is essentially half transposable element. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, there's a lot of uh, repetitive elements um, in this genome. The protein coding uh, genes uh, pretty, uh, fit pretty well within what we know about previous uh, assembled genomes, about 27,000 protein coding um, region or sequences. And uh, it is uh, distinctly and notably incomplete as a reference genome. If you look at the top right corner here, um, BUSCO scores are often used uh, as a way of assessing how complete your genome assembly is, uh, looking at a bunch of single uh, copy marker genes, looking for their presence or absence in an assembly, and that gives you a sense for relatively how complete the assembly is. And we found about three quarters of the single copy marker genes for stromatopiles generally, the, the single marker genes that every stromatopile should have for the most part. So just how the most interesting thing here for me is just how large this genome was. I expected some 200x coverage of my genome assembly for my long reads, and I did not get that. I got something more like 15x uh, coverage. Um, this is much larger than most published diatom genomes so far. Um, if you look here on the right, oh, not yet, David. Um, if you look here on the right, you have up at the top a bunch of um, published diatom genomes. And for the most part, they're in the 30 to 150 megabase area uh, region. There are a couple like Porosyra glacialis and Thalassiosyra, uh, Thalassiosyra species that are draft. Um, the Porosyra is a draft uh, genome from Andy Alverson's lab, um, where they found a very large genome size. And the Thalassiosyra is from a Delmont et al. paper recently, where uh, they were metagenomically assembling they were assembling mags and found uh, a very large Thalassiosyra species. But for the most part, they're quite a bit smaller. Uh, 1.4 gigabase is also much larger than uh, many non-diatom algal genomes here. So if you look a little below that, some of the dinoflagellates up top have pretty big genomes, but the chlorophytes uh, like Chlamydomonas and Chlorella, uh, they have very small genomes. Iso uh, some of the haptophytes, like Emiliana huxleyi, also quite small, similar to the other diatoms. Um, and the crypt cryptophytes also pretty, pretty small by comparison. And then interestingly, I think most interestingly, um, a lot of other, it's, it's similar in size to some recently sequenced polar taxa from every trophic level. This is, includes diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, and then uh, larger macroscopic am animals like Antarctic krill and, and salps and uh, nothenioid fish, uh, fishes. Uh, so it, very interestingly, it, seem, it seems like there's something going on here with um, polar environments uh, in that they, they, it seems like there is some relationship or some driving force that may be making genomes bigger in this part of the world. Very unclear what it is, but I thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, yeah, now that we have a sense for generally what that genome looks like, let's take a look at the genetic diversity of uh, our 30 genotypes. So uh, in general, we found significant genetic diversity, I, I would call it. 
Um, if we use the common measure of nucleotide diversity or pi, um, which is essentially the likelihood that any two um, uh, base pairs are uh, the same or are different in a genome or for a given locus among a population of individuals. Um, nucleotide diversity is about 3%. And if you use a common um, population genomic uh, calculation, that corresponds to about a 15 million, uh, 15 million individuals uh, for an effective population size, which uh, is in line with recent estimates uh, from a fragile Ariopsis cylindris uh, genome paper, as well as, um, as some work by um, um, Filatov and um, Krasovic, uh, who are studying DITOM uh, mutation rates. And this is just a graph showing that that, um, if you look at it in a sliding window context across the genome, the nucleotide diversity is fairly stable across the genome and, and at about 3%. Um, Another way to look at this genome, instead of looking at the diversity for all 30 individuals together, you can look at the individual heterozygosity. So this is essentially how many sites in the genome, um, how many non-coding and non-repeat sites in the genome are, uh, are uh, biallelic uh, um, and are heterozygous. And what this shows is that, again, we have about three to 4% heterozygous sites in each of these assembled genomes. And importantly, or interestingly, it doesn't seem to be varying by region um, or by station. And that, that level seems to be pretty stable across the board. So why do I say this is significant? I think it's significant and, and generally high diversity um, because when you look at other diatoms and uh, other uh, algal, um, other non-diatom algal genomes or uh, populations, it does seem to be greater than um, what we've seen previously. So um, uh, this includes model organisms that have been in culture for a long time, like Phaeodactyl and Tricornutum, but it also includes uh, recent estimates of genetic diversity in coastal North Sea populations of Seminavis robusta. Um, so very different type of diatom, um, but but still we're seeing our, our estimate here is kind of being above that. Um, and then if we look at some of these other individual, uh, other non-diatom algae, um, David, uh, it is still similar in scale in terms of their genetic diversity, if not a little bit higher. And then at the very bottom, I added a few um, extra um, relevant, potentially relevant um, taxa, um, some large populate, open ocean populations, um, of plankton and then also uh, Atlantic herring to give you a sense for where our measurement fits into the um, these other recent estimates. Um, and all of these are using 12 to 30 to 40 individuals. So we're not talking hundreds of, um, of individuals in these estimates and we're not there yet. Uh, go back real quick, David. And then I just wanna say that all of this, um, this high genetic diversity does definitely correspond to decades of uh, work with other molecular markers like uh, microsatellites showing that diatoms are particularly diverse, um, both in coastal ecosystems, in freshwater environments, and, as and in open ocean environments. Uh, so yeah, lastly, um, what is, now that we have a sense for this diversity being somewhat high, uh, um, what is the structure of that diversity? Um, well, if we, if we do use a PCA plot as an example, this is again, looking at all 30 genotypes um, and uh, each dot is a genotype and the closer the dots are, the more genetically similar those individuals are. And using 350,000 unlinked intergenic biallelic sites with lots of uh, strict filtering, we get really no regional clustering. So one thing you might expect um, is uh, given the diverse environments that we would have each of these three ecoregions split out and segregate into three nice groups. And we don't really see that. Instead, we see strong overlap. If we instead uh, cluster or color code by station, David, um, and look at the um, how similar individuals from the same station are to each other, Again, we see no real structuring by sampling locality either. The individuals sampled from the same station or stations thousands of kilometers away generally look 
um, there's no real spatial structuring there. Um, and so we still have this single blob. There's a little bit of outliers here and there, but for the most part, a lot of overlap. And we finally, we don't have to look just at the uh, silent, neutral, intergenic sites of the genome, which are often looked at. We can also look at the um, mitochondrial SNPs. Mitochondria are a separate genome in this organism, and they evolve in a different way at a different rate. Um, it's often the case, uh, people think, seem to think that they mutate a little bit faster. So perhaps some incipient diatom genetic differentiation might be seen here in these particular SNP sites as opposed to the intergenic space. And it is um, what we start to see, interestingly. So now we have um, from these 280 mitochondrial SNP sites, maybe three, maybe four clusters starting to uh, evolve um, and develop and differentiate. Um, but importantly, this is not this still these these um, incipient this incipient population structure is not seem to correspond to any sort of uh, sampling um, scheme. It's not uh, we do not these three populations don't correspond to where the individuals were sampled. And then lastly, um, harking back to our uh, potential models uh, patterns of genetic variation, we don't. We also don't see any evidence for isolation by distance or environment. Um, on the right here is a, a graph showing the pairwise genetic and geographic distance for each uh, pair of individuals. And uh, we see that genetic similarity does not decrease as spatial uh, distance increases. So we would expect to see some sort of positive um, relationship here where the farther uh, away these two individuals are, the less genetically similar they are. And there's really no, um, no trend here in either the positive or uh, negative sense. Um, I'm not showing, uh, you can go to the next one, David. Um, and in the same way, although I don't show it here, uh, we see the same thing happen with environmental distance. As two individuals are sampled from increasingly disparate divergent environments, we do not see a similar uh, trajectory in terms of their divergent genetic structure. Um, and this is just a couple of uh, statistics reinforcing that where we don't see any, um, using simple Mantel and partial Mantel tests, we don't see any relationship between these um, variables and um, yeah, so. So in summary, we found that actinocyclus, actinoculus um, is a very large, uh, has a very large genome and it's very full of repetitive transposable elements. Um, Genetic diversity in this diatom is relatively high compared to other diatoms um, where that a measure has been assessed previously and also uh, compared to other model algal species. And this diversity is similar to uh, increase in, interestingly similar to other polar taxa. And then finally, it, it does seem that uh, actinocyclus, actinocyclus actinoculus genetic variation does not appear to be spatially structured uh, or environmentally structured among sampled localities, suggesting uh, possibly some panmixia is at play here. Um, there are, are a number of implications of this work um, and some new questions that uh, pop up all over the place um, as I've been working through it. Um, as I suggested earlier, one of the most interesting questions here is whether or not polar systems are promoting or um, are in some way helping or leading to inflated um, bloated is what I usually call it, uh, diatom genomes, and, and what might the mechanism be for that? It's not really clear um, yet. Uh, high genetic diversity in this species uh, implies that there is some sort of, that there may be some high adaptive potential, uh, uh, some considerable adaptive potential and resilience in this organism and potentially Southern Ocean diatoms more broadly. This um, High genetic diversity corresponds to large population sizes, which can more uh, in which natural selection more efficiently can act and and uh, lead to really uh, hopefully not evolutionary rescue but successful adaptation to uh, rapidly changing conditions. Whereby, as many of you may know, that polar oceans are are changing uh, very very quickly. So, um, in addition to the genetic diversity, uh, apparent panmixia 
suggest strong gene flow in the Southern Ocean among populations and uh, suggest a prominent role for the ACC as a, as a mode of uh, connectivity in the region and making it quite distinct, I think, from uh, potentially from um, temperate and tropical environments. And then finally, uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, structure that we found here uh, suggests that there may be some unexamined ecological or environmental drivers that are shaping um, population dynamics and structure in the region. And um, it'll be interesting to uh, explore these to, in greater detail as I start to get a better hold on both um, these two data sets, but also other genomic compartments um, in the uh, assembly that I have, notably the intronic space, the exonic space, and stuff like that. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for um, attending my talk, and I'd like to acknowledge my advisor and my lovely um, lab members, past and previous, for all their hard work and help. They did all of the sampling of this data, collecting of all these isolates um, aboard the Nathaniel B. Palmer. Celia Gelfman, who's in attendance here, for her tireless uh, work and help um, supporting me and, and, and keeping all of these thousands of Southern Ocean diatom isolates um, healthy and happy. And then also the captain and crew of the Nathaniel B. Palmer, as well as my NSF funding, um, which has supported all of this research. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I'll take any questions you have. I'd love to chat about it. Thank you very much, Ian. I think you did a great job there. Um, and thanks for bearing with me while I was trying to anticipate your slide changes. And, well, it's um, good to have a friend do that because you knew when I needed to do that all. <laughs> I was trying to read you, trying to, maybe, maybe sometimes I was ready to move on before you were. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm just curious, uh, one of the things you um, mentioned was the, the difference between the mitochondrial diversity and, and the rest of the genomic diversity. Um, can you define um, maybe what you're comparing that uh, between the mitochondrial and the rest of the genome with? Does that include the chloroplast genes? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, one of the uh, first major um, things that uh, you, you need to do in this type of work is to isolate these different genomic regions. Once you have this, this diatom genome, you can then separate it out into intergenic space is what essentially the the part of the genome in the nuclear genome that is not where protein coding takes place. No genes, no repetitive regions, which complicate all this analysis, just the parts in between. Um, so that's one region. You have intron region, you have exon uh, regions. You also um, have a, I also have a fully assembled and annotated chloroplast genome. And then I also have a fully annotated and assembled mitochondrial genome. So once I've split those apart, then I can align all of the short read sequencing to each one of those sections and look at just the variation in each one of those sections. I didn't show it here, but the um, pattern in a spatial and population structure for the chloroplast is very similar to the, um, to the nuclear energetic space. There's, there's no spatial structure there as well. Um, really, it's only the mitochondrial uh, space where you see uh, any sort of um, uh, divergence. And if you look at some of the literature, um, that those three big compartments, the chloroplast, the mitochondria, and the, and the nuclear genomes, they seem they evolve at different rates. And importantly, different lineages, like plants, animals, protists, different protists, they all, you know, it may be high in one and low in the other, depending on where you are in the, in the um, biological world. So uh, in, in the only data there is really in protists suggests that the mitochondria is the fastest mutating of the bunch. And so maybe that's partially explains some of that um, population structure that we're seeing there. Cool, thank you. Um, I see some uh, hands up. I'm not sure who was first, but I'm gonna just call on Mark because he showed up at the top of the list. All right, thanks. Uh, ni nice talk, nice talk, Ian. Um, I have sort of three related questions for you. Um, first, were you, were you doing all this isolation also shipboard? That uh, yes, so I didn't do this isolation shipboard for this project, but I've done it on a bunch of other ones. So essentially what we do is we strap down dissecting scopes uh, 
and <laughs> and the bo boat is rocking and <laughs> we are trying to isolate a single cell so we pull with a ctd comes up with a bunch of water we bring in a couple liters we concentrate it and then we start picking cells and putting them into 48 well plates um, you're trying to isolate a single cell and pass it through some filtered seawater and then you do that enough that just by statistic by like the statistics of large numbers eventually you get a lot of single cell isolates which are clonal cultures at that point okay now i, I was yeah i was curious if you were trying to do this shipboard and i was only imagining the what what, yeah. what that must be like and, and celia <clears throat> especially for, can speak especially for too. any anyone who gets gets seasick um another question uh, this actinocyclus, I, 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 I'm, I have not ever heard of this species, so it's a little surprising. Is it, is it, were you targeting this one specifically because of its, its uh, sort of role in the ecology down there, or is it, is it a weed? Is it, you know, what, why, why, uh, how did this actinocyclus come to the top of the pile for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, uh, the short answer is the actinos, this actinocyclus. Um, is we landed on this this taxon because it represented it was the species where we had the most the no, most number of individuals that spread a broad environmental and geographic range. So there are a couple other taxa like the last Cyrotumida, Stellarima microtrius, some of these other um, uh, a couple others, uh, Pseudonitia subcurvata. These are taxa that we have a bunch of cultures of, but they're all from the same locale. They all came from one station or whatever. And so that doesn't really work with this type of um, analysis. And so the idea was to look at structure. So we need some sort of variation to look in. Okay. okay. As, as to the, uh, just the question of what, what it is and where it is, um, I, I, had, I don't, honestly, to be honest, I don't know too much about it, but because it's not, it's, it seems to be in a lot of samples in the, uh, when blooming, um, when chlorophyll levels are high, but uh, it's almost always close to the, closer to the coast and drops off precipitously as you move uh, northward. And it, uh, if you look at one of the best uh, resources there is some of, some of the old um, transects uh, that Hasla um, mapped ge uh, biogeography or um, a bunch of transects in the Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean kind of show that drop off really strongly. So it's usually there in low relative abundance, but um, more consistently, I would say, than other rare taxa. That's that's about where I put it. Interesting. Um, I was I was I, as you were nearing in on the results, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be so cool. He's going to talk about you know distance and environment and this incredible you know genetic uh, dissimilarity. Oh, and it didn't work out. I assume you guys are working or trying this on some other taxa as well. Do you expect other polar taxa to give you different results in this? Or do you think that most of the polar diatoms are going to follow this type of a pattern? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, well, we are not working on other taxa. This is this is kind of the the data set we have to work with, but um, you might expect different um, results depending on the taxa based on really divergent um, ecological niches like uh, Fragilariopsis kergolensis is this gargantuan population that is at much higher latitudes and and really all over the place and you might you might accept you might expect a similar condition there or a similar pattern just because it's so deeply integrated with the Antarctic circumpolar currents. Um, yeah, not really sure. Uh, this is kind of interesting because it does represent a, a rarer taxon, something that's a little closer to the continent. Like I said, there's not a lot of um, research into it yet. There was a paper last year or uh, two years ago now, maybe um, by po Postal et al, where they found a real strong, they found a nice strong signal, um, a latitudinal and temperature uh, signal of genetic divergence um, as you went up. But really what they found is that the frontal boundaries made two populations. So it wasn't that they found some sort of seascape genomic like um, you know, change in evolution or change in uh, genetic um, relatedness as it relates to temperature change, but really just a discrete um, two populations above and below the 
circumpolar current or frontal okay. battery. All right. Thanks, Ian. Great talk. Yeah. Cool. Now we're going to go to Jan, then Sarah, and then Matt. They're just lining up for you, Ian. Let's hear it. All right. <clears throat> very interesting. Thank you very much, Ian. That was, that was a lot of fun. Um, so I I'm wondering with this big genome, if there are, and, and you know, I am not familiar with the genetic tools or the, the statistical analyses that you, you could do, but is there some way that, maybe is it possible that there's a, just a small part of the genome that is changing. And I heard the discussion of mitochondrial chloroplast, but if you looked at specific genes that would really be selected for mm -hmm. uh, versus, I got the impression that this is kind of like in, in, in my world, uh, looking at all the species and looking for differences in bi uh, genetic diver or uh, in, uh, species diversity and not seeing a pattern in that, but if I look for specific sensitive native species, I see a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. So is there some kind of analytical tool or approach that you could actually, and is there any, any reason to think that if you uh, narrowed your focus at, uh, on specific genes or um, a subset of genes that might be finer than you've looked at, that you might see that pattern. You might see some pattern. Yeah, that's a good question. So you can um, you can start to tease that um, that adaptation out a bit if you look in certain places. So one of the things that I'd like to do next is to take the uh, protein coding sequence that I've annotated and then look at differences in. Um, variant sites for the, what are called the silent and non-silent or synonymous and non-synonymous sites in the genes. So some, for some parts of uh, protein coding sequence, if it changes, it has a big noticeable effect that natural selection can act on. Um, some parts, if it changes, it doesn't, doesn't do anything, it's silent. So um, by looking at some of those rates, you can start to identify genes that are, um, under positive selection and, and maybe adaptive in the Southern Ocean context. And, and, and by looking specifically at that, those genes, you might start to see maybe spatial or environmental patterns therein. Um, yeah, that's definitely on the list. It's just a little farther down the road. <laughs> so if, if, um, uh, do you think that part of the lack of the overall diversity patterns are in the rate of mixing of the water in that circumpolar region versus other areas where <clears throat> the, this, you know, the time that a current returns to the same location is much longer mm -hmm. um, and, and potentially maybe the turbulence is less in mm -hmm. some of the other currents uh, that in this, in this area. So why aren't you getting that diversity pattern over? And is this over similar to your geographic areas, why, why wouldn't you get this pattern um, there versus other places? Hmm. So I, I guess I can, I can speak to, uh, like if we think back to the um, two diatom patterns I showed, the two temperate diatoms, um, for uh, Whitaker and for the T. rotula, that, in that case, they found that um, you have populations, sympatric populations that are overlapping at a global scale. So you have individuals from Narragansett Bay here where I am in Rhode Island and Puget Sound, ostensibly uh, mm -hmm. decades plus, um, decades-ish scale uh, connectivity in surface waters um, leading to them being in the same population. And really what it looks like there is that everything is getting, uh, even at the scale of decades, everything is getting everywhere in the ocean, as they say. And then these local environments are selecting pretty strongly um, mm -hmm. and populations are sympatrically diverging. But uh, as you say, the, the circumpolar current is operating, is moving water at a much, not, you know, it's, it's just a lot faster and, and more constrained. Um, water moving out of, the, out of the Southern Ocean is usually moving, subducting, and not subducting, but going down and then in the uh, lower um, mid-pelagic, so mesopelagic. So it's, it's 
really isolated from surface waters just across the subtropical divergence. And so I was just kind of interested in how within that really isolated system, what populations look like, since it's such a unique context compared yeah. to temperate systems. Maybe it, what would be interesting to me is if someone were looking at this in gyres, um, in large gyres, you might find similar patterns and over very large scales too, so. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Cool, thanks, Jan. Let's go to Sarah. Thanks, Ian. Um, super interesting talk and Maybe this uh, takes off a little bit from Jan, Jan's questions, um, just about the variation in the environment. So, in is this relatively, you know, in that current? I missed if you talked about differences in chlorophyll or or um, temperature. Is it is it pretty constant? I'm kind of thinking that way because even I you know don't think of the Antarctic as being you know strongly seasonal of course and and be even between um, the ice season and non ice do you think the same thing is is going on um sorry so you think it's can you can you say it one more time I don't know Okay, well, maybe I'll just start with the, the last part is, um, do you expect these patterns that you see to hold on an annual basis? Does this diatom persist during um, under the ice or? Um, yeah. yeah. So, so it's, def it's definitely um, commonly found in and under sea ice. So cl clearly, I, I would expect that population or genetic dynamics are deeply complicated by the fact that you have a major clonal expansion blooming event at one time of the year, and then some population holding on through the next year. And then in the second year or longer multi-year ice, it kind of seeds the community, um, the waters around it and blooms again. So there might be these patterns of bottleneck, genetic bottlenecks every year that influence um, the pop, like the population structure. I can't remember off the top of my head, or I'd have to think about what that, what the implications are of these annual intense bottlenecks. A couple of people have looked at clonal expansion. Uh, I think in, um, in the Gulf of Naples, looking at this kind of process and how it plays out in a population scale, but. I'm not really sure, but te the temporal dynamic, that, that strong seasonality should have a pretty strong effect, possibly a stronger one than the environmental distances, differences between geographically distant um, um, localities, I would think. And then um, at the beginning, you, you talked about standing genetic variation. What does that mean? Is that just the scope of genetic variation without having mutations? Yeah, it's essentially what's there already. So a lot of times we talk about evolution in response to climate change as, um, you know, people think, oh, well, this new condition will elicit um, new selection and, and, and new mutations will pop up and be selected for. Um, but there's a lot of variation already there. And that variation will be um, more or less adaptive in the new environment. And so it's it's definitely the case that when you have a lot of variability already present, natural selection can act very efficiently and quickly respond to rapid environmental change. So yeah, it's just like, it's just what's there already that um, has profound implications for evolutionary rescue if you're uh, in other systems where you're thinking about really small populations too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt. Uh, do I have, do I have time here? <laughs> yes. We, we this might, uh, this might come down to, uh, um, some emails as well, but, um, first and foremost, really, really cool talkie and really cool project. Um, you mentioned actinocyclus as being, as being sea ice associated, but this is, this is a planktonic diatom in ecology or not quite sure. It seems 
at the very least, it's it's both. So we collected all of these in uh, open surface uh, surface water, like one to five meters deep, um, but actually some down to 40 or 50 meters. Um, the mixed layer is really deep there, so that that's fine. That makes sense. But also, it's it's regularly collected associated with ice as well. So uh, it's maybe particularly plastic or flexible in that regard. Not yeah. really. Cool. And then uh, you showed you showed a chart comparing um, this this sort of level of of population level dynamics in in four diatoms. Mm -hmm. It was it was what Phaeodactylum, Phalaciosyra, and Seminovis. Yeah. But none of those others are Southern Ocean diatoms, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm really interested in in the effects of um, gamete structure, mm. right? You have uh, the 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 pennate diatoms. You have these amoeboid gametes that rely on cell cell contact versus mm -hmm. versus flagellated gametes in in Actinocyclus and and the Phalaciosyras. Um, that'd be a really interesting comparison to look at a similar environment, a similar a similar habit, planktonic habitat. And then, um, with the difference being being gamete gamete structure and how that affects the population structure. Yeah, that that especially those um, that uh, centric uh, flagellated gamete structure, and then also um, other life historical uh, contexts like like uh, resting cells would mm -hmm. would should also have a profound effect on on gene flow in this system. And so maybe maybe even uh, accentu accentuated, although um, you're already at the point where it looks fairly homogenous, but um, it might be maybe even more so. Um, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I mean, I wasn't necessarily expecting an answer beyond just confirmation that uh, uh, those, other, those other diatoms were not, were not in the, uh, were not Southern Ocean. Yeah, no, th th those are all, there are another, a number of other estimates that are a little harder to parse because these are the only ones where you're looking at. Um, so normally this type of thing uh, for anyone interested is, is you often use population, like large populations to get at these estimates. Now that we're in the, this genomic era, people are getting better at developing individual based population genetic analyses. And in our protist world, you know, 30, for me, 30 uh, isolates is, is really quite high. All the ones that I showed were at least somewhat comparable in that they were 12 to 36 isolate, individual isolates. Um, but you can also make these estimates based on a single diatom on a, on, um, a couple, you know, people do that all the time in their assemblies, um, in their assembly reports. Uh, but I tried to, at least take a slightly conservative approach there. But it could be the case that you triple or quadruple the size and you get a completely uh, different estimate. I, it's, it's hard to say. Cool, thank you. Yes. Cool, I just wanna throw out one last quick question before we finish up, even though I have about 20 more I wanna ask you, Ian. Um, I'm curious if there, I, uh, I once heard that, that birds has smaller genomes, and and it was speculated that it had to do with the molecular weight of those genomes and the ability to fly. And so, <laughs> if that's even true, um, we'll go with that and and say, is there anything to the heat capacity of DNA and why these polar organisms might have more DNA? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, there is definitely research into the size and DNA content. Um, relationship. Uh, I don't know what specific microbes that data is most accurate for or developed in, but it does seem that larger, larger cells can harbor larger genomes and there may be a pattern there. There also are, um, I just started to think about this. Um, and so I'm not really sure what the state of the literature is, but there are people thinking about metabolic rate as a, as an, um, as a potential having a potential relationship to genome size um, or capacity to respond to um, transposable element pressure. So that size is all because of these repeat elements copying and pasting themselves like crazy in in the genome and. Um, 
these diatoms grow pretty slowly. So this, the doubling time of this actinocyclus is about at its optimal temperature is at about three days, four days. So it, it takes a while compared to, you know, Velocicyrus sudanensis probably daily uh, or less than daily division rates. So um, it could be that metabolic rate has an influence there too. But there, there are definitely relationships to pull out. And I just, it just kept popping up that that there's something weird about the polar system that might be driving um, this distinct pattern. So I'll be interested to keep looking into it. Well, cool. Thank you very much. Maybe here soon we can have a Zoom beer and chat about um, a lot more things. But um, we're at the top of the hour and yeah, great presentation. Um, some some good feedback from folks in the chat. Um, thanks for, for giving us a talk today, Ian, and sharing your work. Um, I look forward to seeing where this goes. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for having me. If anyone has any questions or wants to chat anywhere else, I'm, um, I'll put my email and uh, or my email. I'll, maybe I'll put it up on the web. It's on the website because I'm an editorial board member, so <laughs> we can find it there. <laughs> thank you, Ian, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you in two weeks. Take care. <laughs>